Wow. Okay. <laughs> thank you. That's such that's such a kind kind introduction, and thank you also for the invitation and the opportunity to talk to you today. Um, and um, because this talk is to a wide audience, I'm first going to have to ask forgiveness for some of you, particularly those in the information theory area. This is going to be old news. Um, but um, uh, you know, the, the the talk I think is uh, mostly geared at. Uh, the graduate students, uh, the, the the students, maybe the postdocs are listening to this, and, and part of it is to say that you know you can have a career even if you're not really planning things that well, um, and and, uh, and it's always uh, I think more fun to have uh, to have a little bit of a personal narrative interwoven uh, into the um, uh, into the technical, so. Um, you know, you should always label your axes. So I've labeled it, but I haven't given you the, uh, the units, and that's because I don't know them. Uh, but, you know, theory at the left, practice at the right. So when I started, uh, basically, uh, my, my career in, in 95, I, I had done a um, thesis in information theory with Bob Gallagher, uh, information theory of time-bearing channels. Uh, at the time, you know, they didn't have that, as many people working in wireless um, uh, communications. And so I, I looked for a job. And I didn't look for a job in academia. I looked for a job in industry. And I got a few offers. And I took the only offer that had nothing to do with my thesis. Don't do this. Okay. <laughs> However, you know, the point is that you can do things that are a little dumb and still sort of come out OK, I guess is the, the, the moral of this. And, and the reason for doing this is um, uh, there was an amazing group in optical communication at that time at Lincoln Lab. And they had such good engineers. And I, I had felt that somehow, you know, I would really gotten into the proving theorems. And I had lost my edge as an engineer. Um, and so I thought, well, let me go do that. Uh, and you know, upon going there, sort of picked the one project that nobody wanted because it was so high risk. It looked like, um, you know, um, just a, a very elaborate form of professional suicide. Uh, but I didn't quite know if I wanted to work long term in industry or what I wanted to do. So I thought, well, let me take it. I'll learn a lot, and then we'll see what happens. If at the end of two years the whole thing implodes, I'll just go do something else. Um, and so I started working in optics, and in particular network resilience. Uh, and when I started working in network resilience, I really felt like I was working with some of the most, um, I would say, accomplished um, uh, optical engineers uh, of, the, of my generation that I had the, you know, really the <laughs> privilege of working with. Um, but then sort of the pool of information theory came back. And it felt like a lot of the things that I was doing in this very applied, you know, fascinating uh, area of network resilience had to have some connection to information theory. Um, but I couldn't quite figure out at the beginning how. And so it was this, uh, this uh, hope to try to join the two that really started the work um, in network coding. So let me step back and give you a you know, cartoon version of what is coding, again, with all the, all the requisite um, uh, apologies, which uh, come from the fact that many of you know know this and, and are just sp uh, specialists. But basically, when I'm going to talk about network coding, I'm going to talk about source coding, uh, which is also called compression. So, for instance, doing gzip on your uh, on your computer to send large files, uh, versus channel coding, uh, which is what's used when you're doing transmission over any sort of unreliable medium say, wireless networks, your phone, the transceiver, you know, the, the network card in your computer, whatever it may be. And the idea with source coding is sort of removes redundancy for efficient storage or representation. And uh, channel coding, you actually introduce redundancy uh, for point-to-point, -point, uh, introduce redu redundancy. And both of these are really, to a large extent, designed for point-to-point. -point. Some of them are point-to-multi-point, -point, but basically, there's a single source and maybe one or several receivers, but there's no complexity in between. Okay, they're just pipes, right? So it's a depth one network, if you will. And of course, um, this idea worked well at the time when you had just circuit-oriented connections, but increasingly that's not what we have. What we have is a network. And so the idea is how do I do coding in a way that moves away from this uh, sort of point-to-point -point view of the network, and really to the fact that you'll have much more interesting, rich, and complicated topologies. 
Uh, so the idea here is that I want to have both the efficiency that is usually associated with source coding and the reliability that is usually associated with channel coding. But I want to do that over an entire network. Now, one of the things I want to point out, because we'll be visiting this later, is the fact that there's a theorem from the very inception of information theory from Shannon that's called the separation theorem that says that as far as at least um, efficiency, overall efficiency is concerned, maybe not you know, complexity or ease of implementation, but just from the point of view of, of capacity of sort of efficient performance, there is no benefit to doing these two jointly. So there's a separation theorem that comes in here. And we'll be revisiting this later, later in the talk. And so, you know, it's the, the fact that your card, your 802.11 card inside your computer doesn't know whether you're sending uh, an email or you're sending uh, a document that was originally in some other format is not just intellectual hygiene, if you will. It's actually the fact that you can separate the two. Okay. So, uh, based on this, um, what are the codes that exist? Well, again, this is a very, very uh, cartoonish uh, uh, picture, and you know, I'm yet again asking for forgiveness from all the people who are specialists in coding in, in the audience. But let's just say that you know, 1948, Shannon comes up with his sort of main results. Uh, and then very soon after, there are approaches to try to implement this. And, you know, some of them are block codes. All of these are algebraic. Uh, then people realize that they can do algebraic uh, manipulations, not just in effect uh, over scalars, but also over polynomials. And so along come convolutional codes. Um, and these are all in the channel coding side. Now, compression is kind of mm, done in a very ad hoc fashion. Uh, I would say until, let's say, the 70s, where people look at loss of compression. I mentioned gzip. Gzip, for <coughs> by and large, is uh, lempel zip, which is a, a way of doing universal compression without knowing the statistics. Uh, and also some very interesting um, results that look very counterintuitive, which we'll revisit later in the talk, uh, such as Slepin Wolf. Now, unless you've studied information theory, you may have heard of lempel ziv particularly in the context of something like GZIP. You may not have heard of Slepin Wolf. Let me just give you the 30-second the Slepin Wolf. You have two cameras, both looking at this room from different perspectives, and you want to have an integrated view of the two. It turns out that you, and you want to send as little information as possible from those two cameras in order to obtain this full integrated view. It turns out that you get the same efficiency, that's to say, as little transmission of information needed if the cameras cooperate than if they don't, which sounds insane. Uh, so, you know, but this is, this is the fun of information theory, right? You get all these fun tricks. Okay. Um, really, I would say this immediately very applicable. This really relying on um, random algorithms, which so, so it dormant, really, I would say, until the 2000s. Uh, along come in the 1990s what we call often modern codes, still point to point, uh, but in, uh, in the early 90s, turbo codes, uh, Beru, uh, Beru, Glavieux, and Titi Majima came up with, with the turbo codes. Uh, interestingly enough, not as information theorists, these were circuit designers, again, true engineers who really understood at a visceral level <laughs> what, what somehow the math had missed. Okay, uh, and, and again, this sort of brings back as to why you need both the, the application and, and the theory, because sometimes the theory can get so caught up in its own models that it completely misses things that, you know, if you've really been in the lab mucking around with an amp, you would realize. Okay, and so they really were thinking of that as uh, of coding as an amplifier and balancing amplifiers. And then there was really the rediscovery, which actually came out in the 60s, of low density parity check codes. It was the uh, um, PhD thesis of my advisor, Bob Gallagher. People had looked at it, gone, I don't know what the heck he's doing, roughly, you know, too complex, whatever. And so it was rediscovered uh, in the 90s and 2000s. Rateless codes, uh, these are codes are basically, uh, the idea is multiple receivers. You don't know ahead of time exactly uh, what the realization of the channel is going to be, how bad it's going to be, and sort of it automatically adapts in a way. Uh, we'll revisit these later because actually we'll, we'll be seeing this in the context of network codes. And then network codes that come out in um, basically 2000. And at the time, um, I was, um, uh, I, uh, as I uh, mentioned, I, was, uh, I just started at Illinois in, in, in 98 as a junior faculty member right after being at Lincoln Lab. 
uh, and I started exploring these in a way that I'll explain later. So just to give you another sort of idea of how coding all comes together, so again, the sort of the, the, the cartoon um, version of what coding does, you have your data, uh, you shrink it first through s compression or source coding, you then expand it, but expand it not necessarily to the, s the original size, it could be smaller than the original size, it could be bigger, but it's not the same expansion, you know, you're not just shrinking it to stretch it out again to look the same. Um, and then, as I mentioned, there's a, there's a separation there between the source coding and the channel coding. It goes through a channel. The channel does something to the data. Some of it is damaged. You see that little damaged rectangle there. You decode to recover the original um, source coded data, and then you source decode. So that's, that's sort of the, the, cycle, the cycle of coding. Okay, that, that's what it does. And separation happens between this and that, okay? That there's, no, there's no benefit and efficiency going directly from here to there and trying to join those two, uh, those two blocks, those two engineering blocks together. Okay, so I mentioned I was working in optical networks. Um, and one of the big things in optical networks is, of course, if you get a fiber cut, you're in trouble because the fiber is carrying a whole lot of data and you don't have necessarily a whole lot of paths to choose from. Um, so the idea is, you know, I may be going down the blue path as my primary. I mean, you know, it looks so silly. You can't believe that people do theory in it. But let me just tell you, it gets complicated, okay? So, you know, it, again, the cartoon version. But, you know, you'd be going down the blue. That breaks. You go down the red. You didn't need to come to this talk to figure that one out today. Uh, sometimes, you know, you don't have an actual path. You just have sort of a general route, which is the outside. You get to a problem and you just go around to the other side, okay? And it, it quickly gets very complicated, very graph theoretic and a lot of fun. You know, the, the, the sort of thing you can, you can really play with for quite a while. But in general, again, if you come at it from an information theory point of view, you're saying, well, I'm just repeating the stuff. And that, as an information theorist, is an example of repetition coding. And that's not a good way to code. Okay, just repeating stuff is a very, um, you know, it, it, it's, a, it, it's, a, it's a really uh, coarse and unsophisticated way of trying to include some level of redundancy. That, that's not what we do when we channel code. We don't just repeat, you know, that, that channel coding that we did. I didn't just repeat each of those little rectangles several times. That wouldn't have been very efficient. Okay. So the key insight here was that what we were doing is we were taking, in effect, the edge incidence matrix of the graph that represented my network. And what we were doing is we were just having the edge incidence matrix represented as zeros and ones. Now, that's sensible enough. That's what we teach our undergrads. That's what I'm doing this term with teaching you know, the algorithms that you know, it's, a, it's, it's, it's not an insane thing to do. But what if I were to replace the ones with something else? OK. So, let me look at this network here, and I have my sources, which I have imaginatively called X. Information theorists always want their sources to be X. But I did take a flight of fancy, because instead of calling this Y like we usually would, I'm calling it Z, okay? So with this, we're, really, we're really going crazy today. So let me look at the edge incidence matrix of this graph, and I'm going to represent it here as F. Let's, let's forget the sort of whether I put uh, an identity, you know, for sort of communicating to yourself as an, uh, as an edge. But basically, this just indicates that edge 1 is incident upon edge 3. So edge 1 is incident upon edge 3. Edge 1 is incident upon edge 4. And in this case, because I have no cycles, and basically everything is, is, is ordered, you know, I have a topological ordering, I have an upper triangular matrix. All right. OK. So the question is, I want to get from the left to the right. And I have, and I'm being really coarse here. I'm not telling you anything about, you know, units. Again, just like I had no units on my abscissa from theory to I have no units here. But think it's bits, bytes, whatever you want. It's one unit of stuff, OK? How do I reconstruct over here what was put in over here, given that all of these, whatever my normalization is, is also one? OK, so I can't, for instance, send x1 and x2 all the way up the top here only have one unit available. All right, so I can look at this and say, well, I can go this way, I can go that way, or I can go this way. I mean, then that's it. And what's the max 
maximum I can send from the left to the right, it's two, because my minimum cut is two. So we know from fold Fulkerson that the maximum flow is a minimum cut. You didn't need any algebra for that. And then if I look at this matrix, it turns out it's also the rank of the matrix that represents a transition from left to right. Now what's that transition? Well, I can either stay where I am, which is the identity matrix. I can apply this edge incidence, this generalized edge incidence matrix once, take one step through it, twice, which is F squared, F cubed, and so on. And eventually, of course, the whole thing, you know, it's upper triangular, it becomes no potent, done. I fall off the edge of the, the graph, okay? I can have cycles, by the way, but remember how I mentioned that convolutional codes are like, are basically like a, um, like, 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 um, codes over scalars, but they're over polynomials, you basically have to have polynomials here with some delay. With the, you know, uh, so if you come from, you know, the circuit theory, you, it's a D-transform. If you're more like a controls or a traditional EE person, it's a Z-transform. Whatever the heck it is, it's a polynomial, okay, in, in delay, so that, you know, you, so that you have some notion of, of time and causality, right, because you can't have an immediate loop. Okay. So, you're summing these path gains, and basically, this was the work that Ralph and I did, and it was really uh, generated from being at the University of Illinois, which is this fantastic environment with you know huge amount of mentoring and conversation and a lot of coffee being drunk. And basically, what was happening is that you know we were fortunate enough, Ralph Coder, the late Ralph Coder, when my closest friends was um, there, also as a junior faculty, we asked Bruce. What do you think is interesting? He goes, you know, he gave us a paper, Boss, Vedi, Lee, Tsai, and Young, that was doing this coding, but it was really sort of looking at graphs and trying to combine them together with algebra. And we said, you know, if we're going to do it as algebra, let's see if we can really do it in an algebraic coding perspective. This is what an algebraic, this is what an algebraic coding theorist would do. Okay, this is the natural, uh, uh, this would be the, 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 the natural reaction of an algebraic coding theorist to a graph. Okay, so we started basically going into this area of theory and saying, well, what can we do from this model? And one of the things that you could do from this model is all of a sudden you could prove pretty complex theorems just with crayons. Really, just with crayons. You know, this, so, you know, it's like when you hit on something like this in your career, you're so lucky. Okay, so basically, you know, imagine they have some arbitrary network. And by the way, I no longer need to enumerate routes or paths or anything. You give me the network. That's f. I compute i minus f inverse, right, which is 1 plus f plus f squared, et cetera. Done. You know, no paths, no nothing, no, no graph theory, algebra, nothing. Right. I don't have to represent anything. So I have whatever mass this is. I suppose here I have three inputs, and I'm going to have nine outputs, and each of these outputs wants to reconstitute all three of the inputs. Okay, so each of those z triplets wants to reconstitute the axes. So basically what I have is I'm going to have a 3 by 3 matrix here, which is whatever pre-coding, whatever pre-processing I do, and I get zeros. Then some unspeakable mess in the middle, I don't care. And then I have the decoding, which is going to be these three blocks. This one corresponding to the blue Zs, red, yellow. And all these blanks are zeros. That means that they don't get to talk to each other, they don't get to communicate with each other. Okay. Okay, so think that I take this and I multiply it by this and then I multiply it by that. I'm going to get a matrix, which is, so here I had a 3 by 9. I'm going to have a 3 by 9 matrix. And this first sub-matrix of 3 by 3 is only going to be, um, is only going to be affected by this part. And this part is going to affect that and this part is going to affect that. It's not the same matrix, but it's just the dependence on this of this matrix on these blocks is the following. Okay. Now, remember the fault Ferguson. What I needed to do was that the mean cut be equal to the max, that the, the max flow be less than or equal to the mean cut. I didn't need algebra for fault Ferguson, right? I mean, bring in fault Ferguson that needs no algebra. That's been known since the 50s, so an algebraic statement about the invertibility of I minus F inverse was kind of, you know, an exercise in, you know, you took too much algebra, all right? Um, but now, let's see what happens here. I want this to be invertible, this to be invertible, this to be invertible. Okay, so for this to be invertible, 
It means that the mean cut max hold must hold from this source to that destination. And it must hold from the source to that destination. And it must hold to the source to that destination. Each of these has to be invertible. That is to say, the product of the determinants of all these three submatrices has to be non-zero. So what happened with fault focusing? Fault focusing, we didn't need algebra because I could do all my representations in binary field. Now I have to be careful because these betas, which before I could just get away with just putting a 1 in, these betas, what's going to happen is that I'm going to have to choose them a little bit carefully because these different submatrices, the red, the yellow, the blue, could have zeros. And I don't want to hit the root of any of those submatrices. You know, that's not the most euphonious thing out there. Uh, any of the determinants of any of those submatrices. Does that make sense? So I may have to go up in field size so I don't hit a root. I don't want to pick something that works for the red submatrix but happens to be a root for the blue submatrix. So my field size may have to go up with the number of receivers, may have to go up with the number of submatrices that I need to ensure are non-zero. If the determinant is a zero polynomial, done. But if it's a non-zero polynomial, I just have to be able to make sure that I don't hit a root. Okay? Same thing, I have multiple sources, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. So at this point, you can imagine I can do all kinds of things, like I said, just basically with crayons. So we've immediately proved, you know, in like less than 10 minutes, the fact that for no matter how many sources, if you have a multicast, that's to say that all the receivers want the same thing, I only need the min cut max flow to be satisfied from the set of senders to each receiver individually. That's not just necessary. It was necessary because it's necessary in the point to point. Ergo had to be necessary in the you know, point to multipoint. It's also sufficient. But I need algebra for that. So here's a trivial proof of something which was very vexing if you had to take sort of a traditional approach, say, using Steiner trees. I love Steiner trees. I spent a lot of time <coughs> with Steiner trees. I used to publish in Steiner trees before I did this. Okay, so it's not a diss on Steiner trees, but man, are they hard, right? And they don't get you to this. They don't get you to this. So done. So it's not just that it's going to do better. It's also that the construction is absolutely trivial. You know, and I think in the, very often you get people like, well, you know, but if I used a combination of Steiner trees, okay, you can do a convex combination of Steiner trees. But it turns out, and I'm not going to go into it, that if you look at the optimization using network coding, it actually is the relaxation of the integer constraints in the Steiner tree problem. And you're removing the integer constraint, you're removing all the complexity, all the difficulty in the Steiner tree problem. Okay, so even if you're not doing it for throughput, you should do it just because it's so much easier. Just so much easier. Okay, so now, how do I construct, how do I select these betas? So remember, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to avoid roots in the determinants of these different sum matrices. Okay, so I could do two things. Thing one, I could be clever. <laughs> I'm not going to do that. Thing two, I could just be a complete slacker, pick them at random, and see if it works. That sounds really good. So we're going to do that, and we're just going to choose a big enough field that the probability of hitting a root is small. Okay? So if you, you know, that's so you can call it the slacker approach, or you can sh you say that using randomized algorithm and you applying short zipple, and then you sound smart as opposed to just you're a slacker. But we all know that it's just I don't want to do anything. So basically, you, you can do it this way, and it, it looks just like a bipartite matching. For those of you who are in the bipartite matching games, you know, it turns out to be an Edmonds matrix. It's you know, really shows up like a bipartite matching. And then, this is the only ugly thing I'm going to show you. But for those of you, the happy few, the information theorists, you may recognize this as a paper from the 70s, from Imre Chizar, where he finds the probability of error from Sepp and Wolf. I mentioned to you what Sepp and Wolf was, the two cameras. Okay, the probability of error um, when you choose randomly the code. Turns out something wolf can be done also with a random code. And everything's the same for us as for them, as for, as for him, except that we have an extra term here where L is the depth. Remember how I told you that really what network coding is is going away from depth one? Okay? So the only difference if you were doing Sepp and Wolf is you have the same, you know, I forget what it is, you know, okay, divergence, whatever, Kubla, Kleber, blah, blah, blah. That's the only difference. 
So really all it is is now we're coding as a generalization of Seppenwolf multi-source compression to an entire network rather than a depth one. It was there all along. We just didn't know it. So, you know, there was a question that people would ask sometimes, well, can you separate network coding from source coding? Because we're so used to separating source coding from everything else. And the answer is no, you can't because it's the same thing. Okay? It's the same thing. It's, it's just a generalization. Or rather, what we used to do is a special case of network coding. Okay, so at that point, we got very happy and, you know, we started doing a lot of algebra and, you know, you go you have fun for a while. But then the question is, how would you actually stick this in a network? Remember that I was feeling very good as my, my uh, I was very feeling very good about myself as an engineer when I was doing this optics, security, and resilience, you know. And now I'm like, I'm back to mucking around with information theory and Slip and Wolf and error exponents. And, you know, it makes you very happy. But then you're like, you know, what does this do for anybody, <laughs> right? Um, and so the, the question that uh, Ralph and I asked is, well, how can we start putting that into practice? And what does it mean? Okay. So, you know, forget about short Zippo. I have an IP packet. It's a vector, zeros and ones, or whatever I want. It's a vector of elements in a finite field. And what does it mean to do a random code? It means that I take my packets and I just sum them up as vectors weighted by some coefficients. And those coefficients are chosen over a large enough field size that I'm unlikely to get degenerate matrices. That's it. OK? So that's it. So this is my network coding. I basically have two equivalent representations. I have four unknowns for equations. So I can represent it either as the original four variables, or I can represent them as these equations. The two representations are equivalent. That's it. OK? Um, what does that mean, actually, from you know, transmission uh, of representation? There are different ways. And by the way, we have implementations. This is an implementation that's done in between a TCP socket and IP. So just as a shim layer, uh, we have, you know, we have uh, up implementations that are entirely in the application layer, opening an IP socket, but sort of reproducing the entire stock, the entire stack of TCP, okay, and just using, opening a UDP connection. So there are all kinds of ways that you can do it. But here's one. So I have my packets, I have my TCP subheader, I have my data, it starts in somewhere. I take my source and destination port because I need to know where I'm going. <laughs> and you know, the base, whatever field I'm working in, how many packets I'm combining. So where does the data start and end so I don't misrepresent missing data for existing zeros? And my coding coefficient, and I can either express it exactly or I can have a shared seed. You can imagine all the dastardly tricks, you know, many, many fun things you can do. But, you know, here's, here's what, this is how you represent it, and that's your overhead. It's very small, okay, it's generally under 1%. So what do I do with this? Well, I had talked about not resilience before. I talked about efficiency. I said it was source coding, and I told you channel coding was for resilience. But what happens if I just have erasures? Well, suppose I have four packets, and I have three receivers. And for the sake of illustration, let me assume that I have 50% loss. And the 50% loss happens in such a way that each of these receivers is missing two packets, but not the same two packets. So in this case, every packet is missing from at least one receiver. If I was to do a repetition code, I would have to repeat all four packets. But because I'm only missing two degrees of freedom from each receiver, all I need to do is send two random coded uh, packets. And now with just two transmissions, everybody's happy. Very simple, right? So I've just halved the amount of redundancy that I would have had to send. All right. I could have done with that with some other codes, like a fountain code and so on. So what's different here? Well, suppose that now I have a daisy chain. So again, remember, the idea was to go away from point to point, or even point to multipoint, but to a network. So imagine that I just have a daisy chain. I have 10% losses. So you can see it's like I'm getting you know, progressive um, deterioration as I go through the network. If I have 10% losses, and I have to put all my redundancy up front, I have to put 37% redundancy up front. And if I have more losses, more hops, my throughput, my capacity is going to go down 
exponentially with the number of hops. I have n hops is going to go down with n. If instead, without decoding, I simply recode, I add just enough redundancy to make it to the next hop. Just enough. Not with decoding, just enough degrees of freedom. I just need enough equations to survive to the next hop. Okay? Now you could say, okay, but here, you know, you could have, so by the way, the throughput here, I don't care how many hops I have, the throughput is always 90%. Eighty-nine percent, but you know, does that make sense? Now you can say here you could have it decoded, recoded, decoded. I mean, never mind how long that takes and how unpleasant it is. Um, what if I had multiple paths? Maybe none of those paths would have enough to decode, but they can always have enough to recode. You just need to know how many degrees of freedom you need to send, and I can either use this as a block code, or I can use this as a rateless code, like a fountain code, which just keeps sending until enough degrees of freedom have been received. So this, something like a fountain code is trivially subsumed. Okay. All right. So at this point, we go, OK, this is, this is kind of interesting. But how do I stick it into a protocol, this reliability? Because a lot of what protocols do in transport is actually ensure reliability. But you know that's not how they do it. How do they do it with, again, asking full forgiveness from all the people who do networking. Now, this is time. And you know this is the usual cartoon version of TCP, where you have this is the transmitter, this is the receiver. I have four packets. I send them four packets. The second packet doesn't get there. And basically, you know, you say, I acknowledge packet one, which is actually, in reality, you ask for packet two. Uh, packet two doesn't get there. Packet three gets there. You acknowledge packet one, which again is request for packet two. This keeps going. Eventually, you get so many requests that you stop. Okay. This is what people call the triple duplicate act. I don't know why, because it makes it sound like there's six, three times two. There aren't. It's not, you don't have three. You also don't have two. Whatever it is, you know, this is what happens. Okay. Um, and of course, you know, you can have selective repeat and things like cubic and so on, but you know, it, it can only keep track of a few out of order. So it, you know, eventually it gets into this problem. Now what's going to happen is instead here, I'm going to send the sigma, this sum is actually just a shorthand for linear combinations using those coefficients that I talked about before. Randomly chosen, thanks to short zippo and my desire to not do any hard work. Okay? So I'm not showing you the coefficients. We're all adults. We all know the coefficients there. But let's say these are sums. It's not always the same sum. Okay? You're not exhoring things or anything. So the first one gets there. The second one doesn't get there. So how do I deal with this? So as you can imagine, we were not the first to think to try to incorporate coding and TCP. So what was the rub? What was the problem before? Well, two things. First. The codes that were out there were block codes. Even if you had some like convolutional code, you started out with a certain amount of data, and then you just sent a block according to that. Or if you're doing something like a fountain code, you started with that amount of data, and you kept going until you finished transmitting that. That's not the way TCP works. TCP works with a sliding window. It keeps pushing data in and out, in and out, in and out with overlap. It's not jumping from one set of data to the next set of data. You can do our natural things of trying to you know, overlap the chunks, but you know, it, 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 square hole, round peg, it's not going to work, or not work well. That was number one. Number two, before I got packet one, and I acknowledged packet one, which is to say I requested packet two. What the heck do I do here? Do I tell you exactly what coded packet I got? It's not exactly what TCP is set up to do. It's just set up to tell you about one packet. Uh, do I wait until I've decoded all the packets? Well, you know, TCP was trying to like have some sort of smooth sliding. And here what you're going to do is it's going to send, it's going to wait, and then you know, it's going to get a whole bunch of acts. You know, that's not what it wanted. Okay? So, all right, then you can say, well, I'm going to make these tiny codes, but wait, then those tiny codes are not very good. And you know, again, you're just going down you know, a, a bad path, a very difficult path. That's not what we're going to do. 
This is what we're going to do. Here's the trick. I'm going to tell you that I saw packet one. What does it mean to see packet one? I didn't decode it. I got a linear combination of packets, which included packet one. And packet one is the oldest packet, the oldest packet I've yet to tell you that I have received a linear combination including. Does that make sense? So I'm not lying to you. I didn't tell you I decoded it. But I can get on with my life. I was like, OK, you got, you got something. OK, let me bring in new stuff. Let me slide the window, OK? And by the way, you can slide the window in such a way that you can make up for losses much later for things that happened before. Because basically, think of like you get a, you know, you get a band limited matrix, like a triplets looking matrix, OK? OK? And so you can keep going that way. Eventually, you realize, you know what? I'm kind of missing some degrees of freedom. They have a little bit of a mismatch between how many acts I got and how many coded packets I received. So I'm going to send an extra combination. Here's an example. See, the second packet got lost. I've moved on from that. But I'm able to unzip this in Gaussian information boop, 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 all the way back up and recover my packets early on, even though I've moved on from the packets that I was missing. Does that make sense? Very counterintuitive, but you know, just zip it back. Question of complexity. You know, how difficult is this? People go, oh, you know, you have to invert a matrix. I'm like, oh, for heaven's sake, you're not inverting a matrix. It's only this wide. You know, I mean, you're doing Gaussian elimination with this tiny little thing. You know, you're just unzipping it. It goes super fast. I mean, not to mention, by the way, you can, you can paralyze this like crazy. Okay, now one of the things you, people are worried about when you muck around with TCP is are you removing the congestion control, sort of the good citizenship part of TCP? Because if you are, you don't want to do it. You know, if people are turning TCP into UDP, which has been often the problem with fountain codes or those kinds of rateless codes, people don't, you know, get unhappy because they're like, look, you're supposed to reduce your rate when there's congestion. If everybody just keeps piling in, then you know, the whole thing comes crashing down. And the fact is, if you really are just missing a lot of things because you have drop tail or some other mechanism, then you will step back. You're just not mistaking, without the need for explicit congestion control, you're not mistaking um, occasional losses, such as would occur in a wireless system, for actual congestion. Okay. So then at this point, we said, OK, we, we have this. And by the way, you know, there's a lot of information theoretic work also on acknowledgments that I'm not presenting here. But then we said, OK, let's do it. Okay? Um, and as all of you know, when you say, let's do it, it sounds like, what could possibly go wrong? <laughs> what couldn't go wrong would have been the, right, uh, the, 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 the more logical question. But actually, you know, after some mucking around, it was clear that it was working. Here's uh, something we're very pleased with. Um, how many people had ever heard of Funafuti? Okay, that makes me feel better. I had no idea that it existed. Um, but I was working with uh, some of the, my colleagues at, um, um, in, um, in uh, Denmark, um, and co-founders of one of my companies, and my colleague Ulrich Spiedel in New Zealand. And Ulrich works a lot in uh, internet access for um, underserved Pacific communities. Okay, so basically you get these islands, they're never going to get uh, fiber, they're too far away, and besides, you know, you have things like, you know, the Ring of Fire and, you know, other, other unfortunate, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> topographical issues underwater. It's just, it's not going to happen. And you're too small to have sort of a satellite beam on you, so it's like being on a ship except worse. Because at least on a ship, every so often, you'll get into the good part of the beam, and you, you can do things here, you're stuck. Okay? So um, this is uh, geostationary. So this is you know, high, so very low, very high, de very high delay, so very high um, orbit. Okay, so geostationary. Uh, and um, basically, what you see here, and this has been going on since then, by the way, um, is here on the ordinate. Uh, in logarithmic scale, losses of packets. Here on the abscissa, in linear scale, days. Okay? And the black crosses are packet losses. The blue is TCP measurement. The red is TCP over network coding with the 
Yeah, so, you know, basically, this involved many islands and um, the student that work has Etwat, uh, who actually was the first Pacific Islander to get his PhD in electrical engineering in New Zealand. And I was very happy he spent a, a, a whole, you know, almost a whole year with me. And then he went to all these different islands and convinced the local sysadmin to let him put our uh, software in, um, in, uh, in their system. And so what you can see here is there are days where basically, you know, without coding, you had almost nothing, you know, but at least with coding, you had about two megabits per second. And there are other days where you really would have been entirely off, just had no connectivity. And you know, the difference between at least being able to get a few emails out and in a day and being entirely cut off is huge, you know. Um, so this, this has been an ongoing project. And you know, as I said, Etwad would go to all these places. Very often, they would only have one boat every two weeks. And you know, he was basically riding with the, with the supplies. OK, what happens if you go to multi-hop system? And by the way, we're doing a lot of, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this generally, yeah. So this generally is using selective acknowledgement, the TCP. Yeah. So almost everybody here is using cubic. Okay. Uh, so that's why I made that little thing about selective acknowledgement. I said, you know, even that, that cartoon I showed you didn't cover selective acknowledgement. It does. Uh, we can go into more details, but you know, a lot of what we were finding were actually uh, queue oscillations in these systems because of the very long round trip times. And we were able to basically sustain, you know, sort of write off, write again, away those Q oscillations. Now, what happens is that the Q oscillations were not necessarily bad when the cloud cover wasn't so bad. But then when it got bad, they just kind of died. And we didn't. Um, so now let's look here at the multi-hop case, because I mentioned you want to do this in a network. These are measurements that are taken from a DARPA project we had. This is actually this, a whole set of trucks running around, and these are the three last hops that are getting to some uh, very challenged receiver, number four over there. And so you can see, you know, the first link is not so bad, the second link is not so bad, the last link is pretty bad. So basically, if I had to put recoding at one place, where would I put it? Which node? The last the three, right? Right before, right before things get bad. Okay. And of course, I would put it at the source. Okay. So this, uh, this is actually what would happen with TCP, with TCP with only end to end coding. And this is with recoding at node three. So what you can see is you get, of course, a huge gain here. Then you get an extra factor of two. But what's interesting is, again, it's not just the average throughput. But how often you, st how long you stay alive? Here you have long periods of times, multiple minutes, where you would have, I mean, you know, forget actual TCP; it's, it's, it's so dead. It's, you know, that is a door. But you know, even if you are just not recoding, it's not so much that I'm ecstatic when I get, you know, this is a nominal one megabit per second, and I get 0.65. I'm really not happy when I'm getting zero. Okay, so the staying alive was was uh, one of the the main aspects here. Okay, at this point, you know, again, remember you start as an information theorist, you can't leave it, okay? You, you know, you can take the girl out of information theory, you can't take the information out of the girl, you know, you just keep going back to this. And you think, all right, now I know that source coding and network coding are the same thing. I'm having some luck with network coding and reliability in these losses. I wonder if there's something interesting to be done between network coding and channel coding. There's no reason to believe that there would be a separation like there is on the point-to-point -point system. And besides, I misspent a lot of my youth, you know, looking at channel codes. Maybe this is the time to like, you know, make use of that because I could combine network codes with channel codes and it just sounds like the mother load. Right? I mean, imagine. You know, you can just do this forever. Okay. So 
But first, let's check there isn't a separation theorem. And what are the chances there would be a separation theorem? Nah, you know. I mean, especially because the, the, the arguments around the separation theorem. Uh, OK. And the short answer is there is a separation theorem. OK? This is very, not very well known at all. And this was really sort of one of the last pieces of work that Ralph, you know, it was really Ralph's idea that, you know, after his death, Michelle Frost and I sort of expanded on. All right, so what did Shannon tell us? Shannon told us you can take a probabilistic model and you can turn it into, synthesize out of it, something that looks error-free. The question that I'm going to ask you, and at first you're going to say, you know, how dumb is that? Of course you wouldn't do that. Is can I take something deterministic and use a probabilistic model for it? Why would you do that? <laughs> you know, it's going again. The reason you would do that is because, you know, in a network, there are many, many cases where you can show that you don't actually, it looks like you don't want to decode. You want to do clever things. You want to do compress and forward, quantize and forward, everything else and forward. You know, I mean, there's, there's a vast, sophisticated, ever-growing literature on this. Okay, and it's difficult. It's very subtle. Now, let me restrict myself just to point-to-point -point links. And let me restrict myself just to memory list, okay? So I can't learn the channel. There's a separation. There's a separation of network coding, physical layer coding. That doesn't mean that I know the capacity region of the, of the network coding. I was a bit triumphalistic there because I was showing you multicast. In general, not only do we not know the capacity region for arbitrary connections, the complexity of the question is itself unknown. OK, so for people out there in complexity theory, go for it. You know, I mean, and so, you know, there's like some idea that maybe it's metroidal. And so like this have some examples under certain conditions you can show, you know, that and some equivalence between certain linear constructions and having metroidal structure or uh, anyway. You can imagine, you know, whole literature there. OK, and I'm guilty of a little bit of it, but, you know, there's tons of it. OK. Um, Yes, but the, the general problem is unknown. Yeah. That's right, but we don't even know the complexity yeah, yeah. of it. So even the complexity is an open problem. That's right. So even for the, the, the two by two, that's right, the, the, that, that we know to be hard, but we know it's hardness, whereas the general complexity is not known. That's right. OK. So um, OK. So basically, at this point, you say, OK, never mind. I should separate the two. Um, does that mean that I would always want to separate the two? Well, let's look. Why would you not want to separate the two? Well, again, from an engineering perspective, the idea that I'm going to take care of everything that's going on at this physical layer and just have bit pipes, you know, I'll, uh, let me start out by saying a lot of people ascribe to it. Okay, a lot of people ascribe to it. Viscerally, I just no. You know, I mean, the, the idea that you would have all these different time delays, all mapping to one code, this would be like the mother of all codes. Okay, you, you, I mean, it's just it's it's it, you shouldn't do things that way. It just doesn't feel right. The question is, am I losing something by not doing that way? And if you think of a concatenated code, you know. We know from Forney, we know from Forney that it's no worse to do a separate design, at least from an error exponent perspective, where you know you have an inner code and then you have an outer code, than to do one big design for everything. So why shouldn't I do that? Why shouldn't I have my physical error code be my inner code? And my network code be the outer code in my concatenated code? It's going to be so much more modular, so much more sane and elegant. But what do I get? OK, so let me look here at some work we did here on low power sensors. This was the first chip to implement network coding. This is work with uh, uh, my, well, now Dean, and Atashanda Kassen, and some of our students, uh, joint students and separate students. And basically, the idea here is you have a channel coding. We didn't pick the channel coding, uh, thanks to TI for, for taping out the the, the chip for us. It's just a very simple convolutional forward error correction code. I've mentioned convolutional codes early in the, in the talk. We have the erasure coding, which is the outer code, the network code. 
Okay. Uh, and then, you know, very simple decoding here, hard Viterbi decoding. So we're not doing joint decoding between the physical layer and the, and the network layer. Uh, super simple, um, super simple <coughs> modulation, just because it's a body area network, very low power, not sophisticated. Okay, it is what it is. So, and then what we're doing here is we're measuring the received signal strength indicator. So it's actually measuring, you know, in dBm, which is mi mi uh, mi milliwatts in the log scale. All right. So here's the packet error rate, ordinate in um, log scale. This is, of course, in log scale. It's in dBm. Okay. One milliwatts, zero dBm for reference. Okay. And now let's look at what's going on. So if what I wanted to hit was a very low packet error rate of 10 to the minus 2. Uh, and I have the choice between, so this is I have no redundancy, no codes. Rate 1 means no redundancy. I can have 50% of my packets be redundant and done at the network layer, or I can have 50% of my packets be redundant and done at the physical layer. Okay? Interesting, and what's the gain, measured gain, vis-a-vis -vis being without any coding. Because coding, remember how I talked about turbo coders? That they have thought about the fact that, you know, really what coding is, is it's just an amplifier. It's just an amp. It's just, a, it's just Galois' version of an amp. Okay, so let's look at this. So what's interesting here, and this is super counterintuitive, you actually get more gain from the network coding here when you're very stringent in your packet error rate than when you're not. If you're a comms engineer, this is weird with a capital W. Okay, you think that the network, it should be the physical layer doing it. Okay, you shouldn't be, you shouldn't be sending your problems to the next layer up. This just, that's just an admission of weakness, okay? Um, so that's what's interesting. What's, uh, on the other hand, you know, if you have a less stringent, then you should be doing it just at the physical layer. So now, what if I do it at both layers? So these are gains in dB. So these are exp you know exponential. Okay. So I'm doing physical layer code and a network code, one half, one half. Rate. One point five plus two point five. If you're an engineer, is three point five. It's pretty darn good. Even if you're not an engineer, three point four plus two point two is five point six. You're getting cumulative gains. Why? Because you should only write your code up until the sweet spot of that code. And when you're getting into the bad part of the code, and those of you who are taking code, you know what I mean, you know, that nasty part between getting to the floor, get the heck out of that code, and send your problems upstairs, which then should do the same thing until it gets into trouble and send it upstairs. So you should only manage things if they're easy to manage. Once it gets hard, stop. Send it to somebody else. You've taken care of what you needed to take care of. You know, the, the rest is beyond your pay grade. And that's it. Um, I can talk a little bit about commercialization. It's theory, practice. I don't know what's what. Um, we've done a lot of work on combining, taking the patents out of different universities, particularly all these patents with my collaborators consolidating them, doing the licensing and consulting, and then having other companies actually doing the implementation. So this is what I learned. One minute. Every company seems like eventually it takes its IP and rolls it into an LLC. So the question I had is, if that's where we're going to end up, why don't we start there? So the IP is separate. It's in an LLC. And then other companies license from this LLC, which itself licenses from the university, because the universities are not in the business of consolidating. That's not their job. They don't go and consolidate with everybody and their brother. Okay? And they're also not in the business of doing the consulting to do the integration into products. Again, that's not their business. Now, even if you have the patents, you can sit there and wait for somebody to pick up your patents. And sometimes you might get lucky, and they might. But by and large, you know, the way that you, you know, the thing that you can put directly into, you know, the, the, the bloodstream of, uh, of, of an engineer is code. 
So you have to take your codes and turn them into code. <coughs> okay, so you need a toolkit, which is what Steinwolf is doing. And then you need products, and then your different products. Most of these are, you know, students that, you know, many of the students end up uh, going through my lab because I have an excellent coffee machine. Um, and basically then they go off and they start, they start, you know, these are not just my students, these are students from all my friends and sort of the extended research family, and they go off and, and start different companies in, in different countries. Okay. So we, uh, my group does a lot of licensing, and we, we, we have very good but we license because we have to. Um, because we have, no, we, 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 we license because otherwise there's no point in doing it, basically. Uh, the research sponsors I want to acknowledge, um, the approach to research sponsors that I've taken is really to be vertically integrated. So basically going from the physical layer all the way to content uh, and only picking one or two at each layer. So there's no competition and you get to see all this layering that's going on. And with that, I'll, I'll stop. And um, that's it, I'll stop, because it's five. And I should stop, and you stay, that's nice. Okay, thank you.